This episode is brought to you by Modal Electronics, who enable you to play and perform powerful sound with their incredible synthesizers. You can enjoy vibrant wavetable patches with the Argon 8 series, or you can produce with state-of-the-art analog style synth textures with the Cobalt 8 series. To check out Modal Electronics' incredible array of synthesizers, go to modalelectronics.com. Modal Electronics, dare to sound different. Well, you know, to be honest with you, I was never in love with music. <laughs> it's sort of, uh, you're frozen. Some, oh, I've, I've never been in love with, well, I didn't start off being in love with music. I'm just turning my phone off. <laughs> um, my father was a minister. So I grew up in Biloxi, Mississippi. And of course, because my father was the minister, I had to be in church all the time. I, um, I was acting up in class one day at school. And, they, and so they told me that I had to go and join the choir. And I was like, but I can't sing. I don't want to be in the choir. And uh, sadly for me, the choir uh, teacher was my neighbor. So, you know, they knew my family and everything. So I had no choice. I had to join the choir. And that's how I sort of fell into singing. And then when I graduated from high school, I went to uh, University of Miami and I met Betty Wright, the late Betty Wright, the singer. And then the next thing I know, I'm in a group. And the next thing I know, to make a long story short, the next thing I know is Rose Rust, but I've never been uh, a fan of music. My mother said that, you know, I learned my multiplications by listening to the music. She bought the record because she said, you can learn a song on the radio. You hear a song on the radio one time and you're singing it, but you're struggling to uh, learn your timetables, your multiplications. So she bought the record at that time. <laughs> so that's how I learned. I mean, I could hear a song and one time and the next time I could sing it note for note, word for word, but I couldn't learn history or anything <laughs> Wow. So, you know, as, as time went on and as uh, the lead singer of Rose Royce is, and being with the guys, I started learning about uh, people like the late Tick Career and um, Gladys Knight, who I fell in love with because I, I sat in the front row at one of her shows and she touched my hand. And I'm like, oh my God, if I could sing, I want to sing like her. So that's how my love of music began. But as a young girl, I was never into music. I was more into voice. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, well, I mean, I wondered when the first time I asked that uh, question, I wondered when the first time someone would be like, well, I'm not actually, you know, in love with music. Because uh, so far, that, uh, no one has. But that's really interesting. I mean, so, so much uh, in your answer there is, is, is interesting. Um, so when, when you first started singing, you know, in church, um, when did, was there a point where someone kind of took you to one side and said, you know what you've got something really remarkable here uh, you should look at pursuing this professionally was was there ever well, a moment like that well not at church because at church I was sort of blending in with the choir and most of the choir were my my friends or my neighbors but uh, as I said to you when I was kicked out of I don't recall the class and I had to go and join the choir we were having an assembly so uh, Mr. Mc, the late Mr. McDaniel, who was the teacher, said to me that you and a guy named Sherman O'Neill, you're going to be lead singing Oh Happy Day in assembly. I'm like, no, I'm not because I can't sing. He said, well, then if you fail my class, then that means you're going to be held back and everybody's going to pass and go to the next grade with you. And I went, oh, my God, my dad, my mom's going to kill me. <laughs> so I said, where are the lyrics? Let me learn that song. <laughs> so. When it came, we, we did the assembly. And when it came to my time to sing, when I finished singing, the whole auditorium stood up and applauded. Principals, teachers, everybody. And I'm looking around, I'm like, what are they doing that for? And everybody was all over me after that. They go, oh my God, you were amazing. And I was like, really? And that was kind of like the beginning for me to know that uh, people thought I had a good voice. I, I, as I said, I was never really a fan of singing. I was more interested in a cute guy than, than singing. <laughs> and 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 so <laughs> when when this happened uh did you start kind of taking it really seriously when you when you moved to Miami when you when you not at all there? because I, I moved to Miami first of all to get away from uh my mother who I call Hitler <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to get away from her because a few, a she was very do. strict my 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 father I could wrap around my finger but my mother no way. So I had an older sister. She was married and she lived in Miami. So I was like, I'm graduating from high school next week. The day after I graduate, I'm out of here. She said, well, you can go now. You don't have to wait. 
So I said, no, I'll wait until I graduate. So the day after I graduated, they put me on a plane. I went to Miami. Uh, about a couple of weeks later, I registered at the University of Miami. A uh, month after that, I was in the student union. And I think I think it was a Beatles song. I, I don't recall the song was playing over the tannoy in the student union. And I started singing it. And when I finished singing, this lady walked up to me. She goes, oh, my God, girl, you got an amazing voice. And I'm like, who are you? And she said, oh, my name is Betty Wright. And I said, OK. Right. So she said, I want to take you and introduce you to my producer. She said, I stood here and listened to you sing that whole song. She goes, you have got an amazing voice. I'm like, girl, I can't sing. I don't want to meet no producers. <laughs> so we became friends. And eventually, she took me into going to her record company. And I met her producers. And the next thing I know, I was in a, a group. We were called Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. They had a Friday and a Saturday, but they didn't have a Sunday. They were looking for a girl to be Sunday. And when they found out that my father was a minister, they go, oh, this is perfect. You are Sunday. <laughs> so we opened, we opened for James Brown and we toured all over uh, South Florida. So we, you know, we opened for the spinners at one time. We were doing, but for me, it was just having fun. It wasn't something I was looking at as a career because I wanted to be an airline stewardess because I wanted to, I knew that I could travel the world for free. <laughs> but after I started flying and I saw how hard they work and how much grief they had to put up with, I'm like, it's a good thing I didn't become an airline stewardess because I would probably be in jail now. <laughs> I'll be like, stop ringing that bell. Why do you keep ringing that bell? What do you want now? We don't have any more drinks. Shut up, go to sleep. <laughs> But of course, Don't as ring well, that bell again, I'll kill <laughs> as, a, as a music star, you can travel the world as well, can't you? You know, so you managed to, to fulfill yeah, but at that, that time, to I never extent. wanted to be, I never thought about, I never thought about being famous. I mean, mm -hmm. that was never something that I ever thought about being famous. I mean, like young people today, they're like, oh, I want to be famous. When yeah. I was growing up, it, it, it never entered my mind. I wanted to be famous. Even when I met Betty Wright and she was a very famous singer at that at that Lovely. time up until you know her her death last year it never crossed my mind anything about being famous even when I was discovered singing in a club in Fort Lauderdale and this guy said to me oh I want you to meet my producer Norman Whitfield we're going to fly you to Beverly to, to California I'm like really I it just even when I was actually there in Beverly Hills sitting in Norman Whitfield's house being famous was not even in, in my mind that's I mean, a very I healthy never, attitude but it's never something I, I ever thought about because I never wanted to be a singer. The only thing I wanted to do was be an airline stewardess. When I was singing with the local band and we were traveling and, and opening for James Brown and the Spinners, to me, I was just having fun. That probably helped because there are a lot of people who take it too seriously and, and there's no, it, you, you lose the fun, you lose the, the, sense, of, the sense of joy. What, what was it like opening for James Brown? um was it well we were like uh, you know, like i said we were just a local band we we played in in the local clubs and uh, we were told one day that we were going to be the opening band for james brown and it was in a stadium and that we were going to get to meet him we were three girls at that time we went from being called friday saturday and sunday to the jewels so we were sort of like the supremes but we sung all the uh, top 10 hits at that time so yeah, we, we, we were taken backstage and we met James Brown and all the things you heard about him, he was saying to the guys, you make sure those shoes are shiny. I want to see my face in those shoes and stand up when these ladies walk. In. I mean, we were young girls and he was like, stand up when these ladies walk into the room and the whole band stood up. We were looking at each other like, cause we never experienced anything like that. <laughs> and he was saying, you, you want to be famous? You want to be singers? We, like, we don't want to be famous. We're just having fun. And you know, he was very nice, very cordial. Wow. Yeah. So that was, uh, I mean, we were excited about that, but still for me, I never wanted to be famous. And funny enough, uh, I guess about maybe seven years ago, I opened for James Brown in Monte Carlo at Formula One for the drivers. Uh, uh, they have this charity and they have different artists there. And James Brown and myself were on the show. <laughs> it was quite weird. Wow. Wow. Mm. And, and what, what, um, what did, did he remember? Uh, no, he wouldn't. Have, he wouldn't have remembered that. So I didn't. I didn't even. You didn't sort uh, of say, yeah. No, because I know he wouldn't have remembered. Because people say to me, "Oh, do you remember I met you last year?" I'm like, I don't remember what happened yesterday. You asking me about what happened last year. <laughs> so yeah, I, yeah. I, didn't even, I didn't even approach it. Because yeah. when you're traveling and you're doing shows and you're meeting so many people, I mean, some things you remember, but it's difficult to remember 
everything. It's just, it's just not possible. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, there's a lot uh, crammed in, a lot of amazing uh, memories, yeah, exactly. no, no doubt. And, and how did things uh, start uh, with, with Rolls Royce? You know, how, how, did, um, how did, what was the band's kind of genesis like? Well, in the beginning, uh, the guys were uh, the backup band for the late Edwin Starr, and they were called Total Concept Unlimited. They weren't, they weren't called Rolls Royce. They had been auditioning with uh, Norman Whitfield, who had taken the band under his wing. Once they played all the music on the Temptations 1990s album, they said to Norman, you know, we, we, we want to record. We want to be, you know, they wanted to be famous because they grew up in L.A. So being famous meant a lot to them. It didn't, as I said, it didn't mean anything to me, but these guys grew up in L.A. You know, they were used to Motown and they were used to people being famous. So they were auditioning girls and they, Norman hadn't found the right girl. And uh, this guy, uh, Joe Harris, from a group that Norman had under his wing called The Undisputed Truth. They had a song called Smiling Faces. Mm. I was performing with the local band at this club. They had performed at some arena somewhere in Miami and they came to the club to party. And when he saw me on stage, he went, that's the girl that I want in my group. Because the girl that was in the group at the time, this was her last tour. She had just gotten married, so she wanted to go home and, and they wanted to start a family, but she knew she couldn't do that being on the road all the time. So he had to look for another girl. So long story short, he told Norman Whitfield about me. They flew me out to, uh, to LA. I was going there to audition for The Undisputed Truth, but Norman said, no, I wanna see how she sounds with my band, which was at the time called Total Concept Unlimited. So he put together a little rehearsal. He said, these guys can play any song that's in the top 10. He said, put together a little 30 minute show. We got together and I said, oh, I know these songs because that's what we were doing in the local club in Miami. So I just gave them the, sh the songs that we did in the club where I was performing with, with the local band that I was working with for over a couple of years. So when we finished, Norman came up to me and he was hugging me. He was like, yeah, I'm going to make you famous. You're going to be a star. And I was like, I don't want to be a star. I want to go home to Miami. And he he looked, he took my shoulders and he turned me around to face him. He said, the next time you go to Miami, you're going to be so famous. They're going to be running down the street to see you. And I was like, yeah, right, whatever. So true enough, <laughs> he didn't put me with Undisputed Truth. He put me as the lead singer of Total Concept Unlimited. He changed the name to Rose Voice. The next thing I know, we've got Car Wash. That's you know, the biggest record in the whole world at that time. And a year later, we went to Miami and we were on the coach and people were running down the street calling my name. <laughs> oh my so God. it all came true. Yeah, but, but you know, as I said, it was never something in my mind. And listening to this man, I thought he was crazy. I'm like, why were people running down the street calling my name? <laughs> Nobody's going to be calling my name. He goes, oh yeah, they're going to be running down the street calling your name the next time you go to Miami. And every day I was saying, I want to go home. I want to go to Miami. He said, you're not going back to Miami until you're as famous as Diana Ross. I went, are you crazy? I'm never going to be famous as Diana Ross. He goes, no, you're not going to be as famous as Diana Ross. You're going to be more famous than Diana Ross. I said to myself, this guy is nuts. <laughs> <laughs> and when, when you became uh, extremely famous and <laughs> when Car Wash became, you know, this huge album uh, and huge song, um, how did you adapt to it? Were you did you enjoy it? Were you kind of pleased to be famous? Were you like, this is all right? Or were you like a well, bit annoyed to have people coming up to you all the time? Well, at the time when Car Wash became famous, Norman Whitfield, he was, he, he sort of sheltered me. I was in this bubble that we've been hearing about lately. Mm. <laughs> Excuse me. I was in this bubble for the whole time that I was in Rolls Royce. So a lot of times people weren't allowed to get near me. So once we, we started traveling and everybody was calling my name and they were shouting and stuff, it, it was a bit weird at first because I came from a small town. I wasn't used to that kind of stuff. As I said, the guys in Rolls Royce, they grew up in LA. So they were familiar with that sort of thing. I wasn't because when I was singing in a local band, we never had anybody calling our name unless some guy was sitting in the stage going, oh, hey, Gwen, you're looking good, girl. You know, that was about it. You didn't have like 20 people trying to touch you and call your name and scream and I love you and crying. So that was really a new experience. So it was something that I had to adjust to quickly. 
Mm, yeah, it must have been. And you've mentioned Norman Whitfield a few times already, of course. And, you know, to what extent was he um, extremely important, you know, in, in, in your guys' music? Norman Whitfield was everything. I mean, he, uh, he wrote the songs, he produced them. He, uh, the first tour we did, he made all our clothes and my shoes. He put the show together. I mean, he, he was everything to us. He was like our father. He was everything. He taught us how to do interviews. We'd sit at his house and he'd have a microphone and he'd be the journalist and you'd have to get up and, and, and he'd be interviewing you. You know, he, he taught me how to walk on stage and he'd say, uh, I, want you, I want you to meet Diana Ross and I want you to sort of, you know, this is how you need to be. And I was like, I'm going to be Diana Ross. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. And she was saying, oh, you know, you need to be feminine and blah, 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 blah. And he said, don't worry, she's going to go home and practice. So we went back uh, to Beverly Hills and I had to put on a pair of heels and I had to practice walking up and down the stairs, walking around in the house, you know, holding a microphone and, and just, you know, sort of emulating everything that Diana Ross had shown me when we were at her house briefly that time because that is the sort of image that he wanted for me. And did you want that image as well? Darling, I didn't know what I wanted. I mean, I was just following instructions because as I said, I had never been exposed to anything like that. So mm. I did as I was told. And as time went on year after year, you learned that you don't really dispute what Norman Whitfield <laughs> says. You just do what he tells you to do. But when you go out and you see it, you know, you see how people react to the way you walk on stage, the way you hold the microphone. Because I had someone say to me, oh, the way you work a microphone is incredible. I've never seen an artist do that. I'm like, well, I'm just holding it in my hand. So, and they go, no, there's a certain, there's a way you work the chord, but it's not something that consciously I ever thought about. I'm just, okay, I'm just saying, you know, doing as I've been taught. Yeah, I mean, you, you obviously have an incredible natural talent for it, but you've worked very, very hard. And I mean, one of the periods that must have been incredibly hectic would have been, you know, following up uh, Car Wash and, 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 you know, sort of the late 70s with Rose Royce 2, Rose Royce 3, both of which were incredibly successful albums. Do you have good memories of the late 70s? I do. I have uh, great memories of, of, the, of the 70s and I have bad memories. So... <laughs> it, it, it's a, a mixture of, of emotions, really. But overall, I'd say it was, it was great emotions because I personally never expected what happened to happen. And even today, people embrace those songs. When I go out and I do shows, I mean, people are screaming those songs like they've just been recorded, you know, last year or this year. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. These songs sound better than... I mean, there's nothing really, in, in my opinion, there's not been that much um, musical improvement and innovation since the 70s and 80s, I think. The pop no. records from that era were perfection, um, in my mind. So yeah, because do you I, listen I to won't... modern music? I do. As I was about to say, I won't call the artist's name, but I was listening to this song that everybody was going on and on about, and they were talking about it. And basically... It was, I won't say the word, but she was going, whoa, 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 for like most of the song. And I'm like, this is a hit record? Where, where the words, where the lyrics? And then she'd say a couple of words and then she'd go, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not exactly what she was saying, but I was quite shocked. <laughs> and I had to go and Google the song so I could hear it again. I'm like, this is a hit record? Really? Mm -hmm. I, I was quite shocked. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, good on you, girl. If you can make a hit record just saying, whoa, 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 and say a couple of words, good for you. Yeah, yeah, for but sure. But I don't think, I don't think in 10 years time, people are going to be listening to that song. I don't think so. I'd be very surprised. No, I mean, it's, it's actually quite interesting to see that we keep returning to like 70s, 80s, to a lesser extent, the 90s. Are we listening to music that came out in like 2002 right now? I mean, maybe a bit, but not really. Uh, do you I think mean, that, that was every, the, perfect, the perfect moment, really? For, for... I was saying to a friend of mine, every commercial I see lately has got a song from either the 60s or the 70s. The music is 60s or 70s music. Every commercial that's out right now does not have one current song. They're all 60s and 70s. Yeah. So, so that says a lot right there. Yeah, I mean, we did something right. 
you did uh, so much right i mean these 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 records they don't age they just they get better and better the more you listen to them they're just they're timeless and so yeah obviously you've kept up um a lot of uh of you know touring and 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 you've you've maintained a, a career over several decades which is you know a very challenging thing to do um how how do you keep going and do you plan on touring again once coronavirus is uh hopefully you know the vaccination program etc roll out and live music well i had a, i had a tour that i should have started last year in may but then the first lockdown came you know the coronavirus hit and we had to cancel it so we schedule it for this year but then last week, my manager called and said, oh, we're going to have to schedule it for next year now because we don't know. We're waiting for the prime minister to say when this lockdown is, is going to uh, end and we need time to promote the tour. So we're going to have to push it back till next year. So I've got everything crossed and hopefully I will get to do this tour next year. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, you know, the UK is waiting for you. I mean, the UK is waiting for the lockdown to end, but I think it will soon. You know the media like uh, sens sensationalization, and and they they probably want to draw this out. But I think the public are, are, are very are very hungry for everybody to get vaccinated, and hopefully for yes. to return. People have had enough. You know, people want, uh, if not a hundred percent normality, people are ready to get out of their houses and go. They, you know, people want to go to the pub. They want they want to go to see a live show. They you know they want to shake their neighbor's hand they want to hug their mothers their fathers their friends you know it's it's, it's crazy yeah yeah uh, uh, human human beings are not meant to to be trapped like this but obviously you know uh needs must and uh exactly yes so hopefully yeah, we well, can I mean, all see each everyone other everyone understands that this is what we have to, you know to save as many lives as, as we can because already too many lives have been lost but but it's it, it's challenging it really is challenging and how and how have you found the, uh, this period? Have you managed to, you know, have you been listening to as much and uh, music as normal, or you know, singing, making music, or, or have you found have well, you found well, it been, taking time I've off? I've been doing I've been doing a little writing, but uh, over the um, around December time, I was very depressed because I should have been back in the states, but I couldn't go because at that time the 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 virus was absolutely totally out of control. And it was difficult to even get a flight. So I had to spend Christmas for the first time in my life on my own without my family. So it took me a little time to, uh, to sort of get myself together. But oh I've, been doing, I've been doing some writing and, uh, you know, I, I sort of work my vocal cords every day just so that I can actually remember how to sing. It's been so long <laughs> since I've been able to sing. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. But I, I, I do miss my family because I wasn't able to have... Uh, Christmas with my family. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. What, so you weren't in America. But I know you... that I'm not the only one. I know a lot of people weren't able to, to visit their families, but when you're in another country, it's different, I think. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it is. And, and it's, it's really a hard thing to spend Christmas away from, from your family. Um, yeah. I'm and it's the first so time I've ever it. done it in my life. Yeah. And then, I, and then I had to talk to them, you know, Christmas, when they hadn't had their Christmas dinner, but I'd had mine, it's like 11 o'clock for me. And they had opened their presents. And, and when I got off the phone, I just couldn't stop crying. I'm like, oh my God, I don't think I'm going to make it. Oh, no. <laughs> but I made it. Uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pleased to, to see that you've, you know, you've survived and, uh, and you Thank know, you. Made, made it through. Because it could be, it's pretty bleak, uh, or it has been pretty bleak in December and January. You yes. Know, particularly in the UK, it's been really uh challenging i think so you know hopefully we're going to come out this the other side and i can think of no better soundtrack uh than than your music uh which is you know so joyous um is is for, for people i mean most of the listeners to the greatest music of all time podcast will be very familiar with rose royce but for people uh who have not checked out your wonderful music before what what do you think is um you know do you have a favorite album from, from your catalog or, or, or a favorite song? Well, I think Wishing on a Star would be my uh, most favorite song, but I think all of the songs, I, I would consider all the songs special. And if there are any younger audience that's listening to your podcast and they've not had the opportunity to listen to any of the uh, Rose Royce songs, or maybe they heard them and they didn't know the group, 
I, mm. I would say, you know, by all means, you know, spend some time now that you're sitting home, you, you really got not a lot to do at the moment, which is coming to an end soon, fingers crossed. And, and you know, listen to uh, Rose Royce, the very first album, which was from the film Car Wash, listen to Rose Royce in full bloom, listen to Rose Royce strikes again. And, and I think they will fall in love with the songs because a lot of younger people may, when they hear Car Wash, they may think of Christina Aguilera and Missy Elliott's car wash, but that's not the real one. <laughs> of course <Rose>. not. <laughs> I mean, it was it was fantastic. They did a great job. And of course, I love Christina Aguilera's vocals, but the real car wash is from the film by uh, Rose Royce. So that's the one that they should listen to. Were they covers? I don't know if I've heard them. Or were they samples? Well, what covers? Uh, like Christina Aguilera and Missy Elliott. No, Missy Elliott. Missy Elliott recorded. The, she re-recorded the whole soundtrack for um, Finding Nemo. All right. Okay. And and what about Christina Aguilera? Did she just it was cover good, the song? But it, it, it wasn't as good as Rose Royce. Well, I doubt it was as good as Ro- Rose Royce. Yeah, they just they just they just they just re- they just redid the song. Missy uh, redid the, the track, and uh, Christina Aguilera and uh, I think. Um, I can't think of her name at the moment, but they just sort of redid the vocals. They did the vocals. It was good. It was good. Yeah, I'm, yeah, sure, it was I'm good. sure it was, but it's a bit kind of like, I don't know, it's a bit pointless covering a classic like that. You'll never get, it's like trying to cover any classic song. Like, you know, there's no point in covering like September by Earth, Wind and Fire or something. You know, you're not really right. going to do a better job. Same with yes. Car Wash. Mm. Uh, it, the, the, these are timeless tunes, but, I, but those, those are fantastic artists, of course. Um, as this yes, is the greatest yep. music of all time uh, podcast, I wanted to ask you um, who in your mind are, are the musicians and bands, artists that mean the, the, mean the most to you in terms of, you know, who you listen to? Um, who would you characterize in terms of your own sentimental meaning as, as, as the greatest? Well, as I said to you earlier, um, the greatest vocal, vocalist to me is Gladys Knight. I mean, when she sings, I mean, she can hum and you just become numb just listening to her hum. So for me, it would be Gladys Knight as the greatest vocalist of all times. Of course, Shaka Khan. But there's something magical about when you hear Gladys Knight sing that for me as an artist, you just you're just mesmerized with the uh, with the way that she uses her vocal and the quality of, of, of her vocal. And, and and the way her voice sounds is just is just incredible. Yeah, agreed. I really want to go and see her live if if uh, if and when uh, things resume because I've missed out on a, on a couple of occasions. Oh have my you, god, she, uh, she's amazing. Yeah, well, presumably. So, have you seen her live uh, a few times? Well, when I was at university, as I said before, I even got into the music business. They came to the University of Miami, Glass Night mm. and Pips. And for some reason, I was sitting on the front row and they were singing, uh, they have this song called Friendship Train. And they came off the stage and they said, oh, shake a hand, make a friend. And as she said that, she bent over and shook my hand and she sort of squared my hand. And I was like, oh my God. And I said to my <laughs> girlfriend after the show, I said, if I could sing, that is how I want to sing. I want to sing and be able to touch people with my vocal and the way I deliver a song like her. And my girlfriend said, girl, you ain't got no chance of singing like that. <laughs> 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 well, you, you but I turned can out you did. In my own way. It turned out you did, you know. Um, <laughs> I did. But it, it yeah. seems like you've had um, and have such a healthy attitude. You're frozen. To, uh, so, sorry, Gwen. Uh, I apologize for these internet issues. I think I'm back now. No, it's fine. You're back now. Uh, the uh, yes. you, you seem to have had a very healthy and have a very healthy attitude to fame and success. And uh, my final question for you is, you know, for those kind of aspiring creative people and artists, musicians out there, do you have, um, you know, what do you reckon is the, the best piece of advice um, that, that these people could follow if they're trying to break through in the music industry or any other creative industry? Well, uh, to answer your question, whatever industry you are trying to break through, if you're trying to be... Um, a physicist, an, an interior designer, if you're trying to be, you know, uh, a Gordon Ramsay, if you're trying to be, you know, Prince or, or, or the Beatles, the, the one thing that you have to do is believe in you. No matter how many times you hear no, of course, you're going to feel rejected because you want it so much. 
But no matter how many times you hear no, uh, you're not the right person, we're not interested, you know, there's nothing happening here for you. Believe in yourself and never give up. And always stay true to yourself. If you are doing music and someone say, well, I don't feel this is the type of music you should be doing. If in your soul, in your spirit, you know that this is what's coming out of you, this is what you want to do, stick to it. Because if someone is saying, no, they don't feel this is for you, then somebody else is going to say, oh, brilliant. This is what you need to be doing. This is where you should be. Don't try to sing like this person. Don't try to sing like that person. This is you. Be true to yourself. And that, that is the, you know, and don't, don't think so much about fame because fame is hard. It's, it's, it's not easy being famous. Everybody says, oh, I want to be famous. It's not easy. No, I mean, it, be it has its perks, but mentally and psychologically, yeah, mentally and psychologically, it's not easy. If you're not ready for it, it will take you somewhere that you might not come back from. So, you know, you have you have to be mentally strong and you have to have people around you that keep you grounded. You don't want people around you telling you how great you are, you know, how fine you look, you know, how wonderful you are. You need people around you that would tell you, you know, you need to sit down, go and take out the rubbish. You know, <laughs> you need to get a different hairstyle. You know, you need people around you that are going to be true to you. Because if you've got people around you always telling you how great you are, that's not real. That's not real life. Yeah. yeah. You know, that's not reality. You need, you need some, to have a balance. You need to have both. You need to have people to inspire you and push you and go, oh, that's a brilliant song. You know, keep doing it, keep writing. But then you need the other side of the coin as well. You need people who will tell you the truth about you. Because you're not always great. You don't always look good. And you need somebody around you or people around you that's going to tell you that. Yeah, yeah, it's very that's true. My advice. So, so you almost need you need to uh, have strong self belief, but you also need to have quite a thick skin. You know, you need to be able to take some criticism without kind of getting too much of a, being too much of a crybaby about it. Really, one hundred percent. Because a lot of people take it to heart when people say, "Oh, I don't think you're a singer." Well, who are you? You don't rule the world. There could be somebody, if not this year, next year, will think you're the you're the best thing since life's bread. Hmm. But if you listen to that one person say, well, you're not a great singer, you need to practice, you need, you know, you need this, you need that, then you start to, to doubt yourself and you start to be down on yourself and, and then you get depressed. And a lot of people get depressed to where it's difficult to come out of that dark hole. Hmm. And of Especially course, if someone you're says young, you're not a singer, you, you know. can you can still take that and say, well, I'm going to train harder. I'm going to sing better. I'm going to do whatever. Exactly. 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 Yeah. There was this girl, before we go, there was, I, I'm trying to think of her name. Um, she was on The Voice, American singer. And she was on America's Got Talent, like here in London, in America. And Simon Cowell said to her, you know, you're not a great singer. And what, what are you wearing? <laughs> and three years later, she won an Oscar for the song she sung in a movie. <laughs> wow. She said, so look what I won. So yeah. good you for know, her. You, you have to believe in yourself. You need to, you, you almost have to be like, um, like a prize fighter. You know, you got to take the punches and get up and, and, and keep, keep punching. If you're enjoying the greatest music of all time podcast, you can keep up to date with all of our latest episodes for free by subscribing. If you're watching on YouTube, the subscribe button is located at the top of the Tom Cridlin YouTube page. It's also at the bottom right of any video that you watch on YouTube. If you're listening on an audio platform, such as Spotify or Apple Podcasts, you can subscribe at the top of the page.